I'm subbing for it. Got it. Okay. Just kind of subbing for Aya Chanda. We hear that she's doing well and everything's going okay, so that's nice. <laughs> I live at Karuna Buddhist Vihara in uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains of Northern California. So uh, I, might, I might move just to warn everybody if the sun comes this way because it moves pretty fast down here in the redwoods. Um, you don't get a lot of sun, but when it's on you, it's really full force. So don't be surprised after the meditation if I'm sitting somewhere else. <laughs> okay. Oh, someone can't hear. Should I just sit closer and talk louder? Is this any better? Yeah? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> okay, so just to warn everybody, today I plan on talking about death and doing a little practice with dying. So uh, if anybody's having trouble with it, please feel free to stop anytime or just meditate on something else, you can mute me. <laughs> it's kind of one of the nice things about being online is you can go anytime and nobody notices. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's good. We'll, we'll just go ahead and start. It looks like people still may be coming in, that's okay. So I like to start with just a few breaths in and out to settle. We all know that we're, we're all going to die at some point. Might not be today, might not be tomorrow, but you never really know. So it's good to get a little bit of practice getting more comfortable with it. If you can imagine, <laughs> we're going to try. So just a few relaxing breaths in and out. If you want to do this lying down, it might be a good idea. Get really relaxed and comfortable. And laying down is nice because there's good odds that most of us will pass in that posture. When you think about the body, one of the first things that you don't need for surviving is all of your skeletal muscle use. And so you can just let your, your face and your neck and your shoulders relax and your arms and hands and chest and abdomen. Just let everything really relax as much as you can moving down your lower body around your pelvis and buttocks and your legs and your feet just letting everything go limp and really relax and you might have some pain somewhere some discomfort See if you can relax around that. Really soften into it and just allow it to do whatever it's doing. No pressure for it to be different. Just letting it be and relaxing all around it. And as the body slows down, shuts down, your digestive system also starts to slow down and shut down. Maybe take one last swallow for now. See if you can feel anything in your digestive system moving around or rumbling or anything. 
there's any tightness or discomfort. Also, just try to let go of it. Just let it do whatever it's doing. Don't try to control anything or push against it. Just allowing everything to relax. Letting everything slow down and come to peace. The next thing that maybe starts to slow down and stop is your heart. See if you can feel your heartbeat. Maybe if you can't feel it in your chest just by itself, maybe you feel for your pulse on your wrist. Just to make it really real right now for you. To feel your heart. Just see what it's doing. See if it's nice and steady or if you've got some heart problems already and you know you have little skips or anything. Just kind of noticing that. And being at peace with whatever it's doing. Because nothing's really wrong. The body's just doing what the body does. And it's okay to just let it slow down and come to peace as your heart slows. And maybe it's slow so much that you don't notice it anymore, even in your wrist. Just slowly coming to a peaceful stop. And the next thing that might slow down and stop, you can watch your breath, watch your lungs. And similarly with the heart, just paying attention to whatever it's doing and allowing it and being at peace with it. If it's a nice, steady, slow breath, that's okay. It's a little bit faster, that's okay too. Whether it's even or if it's a little uneven, a little erratic maybe, that's okay too. Just allowing the body to do whatever it needs to do right now, be at peace with the way it is. Letting go of trying to control it. Because we know in the end, none of us really have control. Not when it comes to the body doing what the body does. Maybe the breath slows down so much that you're not sure whether that is stopped also.
as the body is slowing down, the mind also slows down. All of the thinking and the worrying and the anxiety or fear or even being sort of indulging in some kind of pleasurable thoughts or ideas, emotions. That slows down too. And the mind gradually glides to a peaceful stop as well. no more craving or clinging to anything from this life. And no sense pleasures, no desire for becoming, no desire for not becoming. Just letting go of everything. No longer identifying with me or mine or I. Not identifying with your job or your family position or social status. Your possessions or your achievements. Just putting all of this down. to leave all of this behind and do it without clinging to anything. Just allowing the mind to stop. Maybe your senses have stopped. Sense of touch and smell and taste and sight. Maybe you've already stopped noticing the sound of my voice. Without any of that stirring up the mind, any of the thoughts stirring up the mind, just allowing everything to come to a peaceful stop. Most importantly, allowing the craving and clinging to stop.
And as we slowly come back out of our meditation, slowly feeling our bodies again, maybe moving our hands and feet a little bit, taking this opportunity to appreciate our bodies for all that it, they do for us, allowing us the opportunity to practice helping our minds become clearer. And feeling the need to repay the body's kindnesses by taking good care of it. So coming back with an attitude of gratitude and a sense of peace. Hey, hope it wasn't too intense for any, everyone. <laughs> you all look okay. That's good. No one died on us. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, I thought I'd talk about death today. Can everyone hear okay? Let's move. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah. So I've been thinking about death a lot lately myself because I've been having some weird health problems and um, it turns out my sister is having similar health problems and she's about three years older than me. And uh, it's just kind of a funny coincidence. We haven't been talking with each other very much. And I called her the other day and she, she actually had to go to the hospital for a few days because of stuff with her heart. So, and our father passed away very early when he was 40. And my sister's like 38, she's about to be 39. So it's in our minds like, oh no, did we get the genes? <laughs> so we're both kind of, um, you know, it's, it's on our minds a little bit. Like it's true for any of us though. Any of us can go at any time. We just never know like accidents happen or weird medical flukes happen. So just kind of being aware of it and using it as an opportunity for like realizing that any day could be our last day, our last day living on this planet in this body, in this form. And I'd like to, I've been waking up with this, with this thought of, okay, I have to make today a really good day to die. So like every day it's like, what, what are the things I want to do to make this a good day to die. Like I could go anytime perfectly happy and at peace with it and ready for whatever's coming next. So um, thinking about it, things like, things like Donna really help my mind brighten and feel good, feel like it's a worthwhile kind of time spent during my day. Just doing things like with the attitude of wanting to help other people around me I mean, anything can be done as a, an act of generosity, as a gift, any action you do. It's opening the door for someone or a kind word or, you know, little things too. It's like taking out the trash can be a gift. <laughs> you know, anything done with the right attitude of, oh, I want to help the people I'm living with too. Yeah, it's not my turn maybe to take out the trash, but I want to, I want to help. <laughs> I want to do this service make it nice for everybody. So that's, that's something that's big for me is Donna practice. And as a monastic, there's not much opportunity for material Donna. So it comes out mostly in the form of, you know, kindnesses and um, helping people with things, spending an extra hour after a program to talk with someone who's having trouble or things like that. So 
Yeah, and, and sila is also really important. I find um, what comes to mind for me, like beyond the five precepts for lay people is like the, the 10 wholesome and unwholesome um, bodily actions, verbal actions, mental actions. It's called like, I think they just call them the 10 wholesome actions in the suttas. Um, you can find... It shows up several times in the suttas, but you can find a good list. I think Majima uh, 41 has a good list of, it lists out the 10 for you there. So it's like the obvious precepts of not killing, not taking what is not given, um, sexual misconduct. So those are the bodily forms of good sila for everybody. And the four right speech type things like, mm, only speaking the truth, no false speech, no divisive speech, mm, harsh speech, and gossip or frivolous speech. I find that, like for me, the more I engage in things that don't matter, talking about things that don't matter, the more unsettled my mind is in general anyway, like in meditation, or when I go to bed at night, like the mind keeps running a little bit more. So as, as um, harmless as that might sound, like the frivolous speech, it really does have an effect long-term. So I like to keep that to a minimum. And then they have the, where was I? Body, so we did body, speech, and the mental things, the 10 mental wholesome qualities. So, or, sorry, there's three of those, it's 10 total. <laughs> so like the covetousness, which I find kind of, um, interesting i don't know that i in talking with other people too covetousness is not like a major thing for a lot of us like we don't want somebody else's nice fancy car or somebody else's spouse or whatever it is that we we might want of somebody else's it's more like um some kind of greed not that we want to take things away from someone else necessarily but I don't know, that happens too, I guess. <laughs> it comes up quite a bit in the suits as the covetousness idea. So if you find yourself having a lot of that, I think one good solution might be turning towards mudita instead. It's like, oh, isn't it nice that they have that nice shiny car? Isn't it nice that they're happy in their, in their partnership or whatever? So looking at like the wholesome side of of covetousness. I think that's as close as I've been able to get is just having Mudita instead. And it's the same with ill will. I'm not sure a lot of people, at least maybe I'm biased, the people coming to the monastery might not be your average kind of person walking around out there. But in terms of ill will, it's not so much that I want something bad to happen to someone else or that people want other people to hurt necessarily, but they might, it might be more like anger. They might be angry about something and, you know, kind of want to tell the person, the other person off or something, but it's not so much that they want the other person to hurt or have some kind of harm done to them or anything. So it's just one of those funny translation things. So like, for me, it's like keeping anger to a minimum, not letting it spread to other people, not sort of lashing out at someone or um, even not even like allowing my mind to spend time thinking about whatever it is that's made me angry because long run, it's not good. Even short run, it might feel like um, somehow enjoyable sometimes. Like one of my favorite unwholesome mind states is, is, righteous indignation it's like oh how could they <laughs> that's the wrong thing to do why would they do that <laughs> don't they know <laughs> so it's it's kind of like that the less time i spend on that the easier it is for me long run throughout the day it's like that would be a horrible way to die like if if it was a moment of righteous indignation feeling all upset like how dare that guy stab me randomly and then i die that'd be terrible <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's another thing to to look out for like what kind of state you allow your mind to be in because so much of this is a choice you know like 
we think we don't have a choice over emotions or thoughts that come up in the mind, but just because we're conditioned a certain way, just because there's a lot of karma behind that, moving in that direction to think these thoughts, it doesn't mean we have to actually go with it. We still have the free will to, you know, put, put that mindfulness and awareness to use. It's like, huh, there's this righteous indignation. There's this anger coming up. I got to step back from this and, and do something more wholesome with it and not allow it to run its course and like be in charge of me and what I'm going to choose to do. So it's a good thing to focus on whatever it is, whatever unwholesome mind state it might be. It doesn't have to be anger. It could be greed or any kind of like mm, delusional thought <laughs> about something that you think might make you happy, but it really won't. And then um, we get to covetousness, ill will, wrong view is the last. So going back to the delusion I was talking about, <laughs> any kind of wrong view, spending time like um, just ruminating about things that you know may or may not be true. Sometimes someone will say or do something that I take the wrong way. I'm I'm assuming they intend either to be dismissive or to hurt me or, you know, some kind of bad intention on their part. And if I talk to them, it's totally nothing to do with anything about me at all. Like so little of life and other people's actions. It's, it's about what's going on for them and has nothing to do with you. So I don't know, things like that, that you, we can spend a lot of time and energy on that don't matter and may or may not be true. It's a good thing to be aware of and, and sort of stop ourselves from moving in a direction that's not wholesome. Yeah, and um, other things that come to mind are, are spending more time on like Dhamma activities during your day. That would help it be a good good day to die, you know, meditating every day is good, of course, if you can do it. And maybe even if you don't have long, you know, even if you're really tired and you just sort of say, okay, then I'm only going to sit for 15 minutes. I'm just going to meditate this long every day, no matter what else is going on. And that can be very stabilizing and helpful long run. It's better than, you know, meditating for an hour twice a week or something. If you can't, if you can't find the time every day, so making it a priority so that you can say at the end of the day, yes, I did, I did my Dhamma activity. I, or you could listen to a talk or have a Dhamma discussion with somebody else, uh, or at least talking about something meaningful with them, something that is going to help their minds be calm and settled and, and understand the truth of reality better, say, or the truth of whatever situation they're going through to see it in a Dhamma light in a, a light that sort of clarifies the dukkha, anicca, and anatta of the situation. And even just sitting by yourself and reflecting on dhamma can be a good dhamma activity for your day. Just making sure you do take the time for what's the most important. And if, and it could be anything in that moment, right? Like the most important thing for me to look at right now would be like the not self of the situation from work today say like you, you say you had an argument with a coworker or something and it's it's kind of still staying with you when you get home and you're kind of bothered by it and you can reflect on it as okay this is this situation is is not me things just happen did I do anything wrong here looking at your actions and your speech. Did I do or say anything that was unwholesome? Did I lose mindfulness and lash out in anger? Was there any kind of fault that I can find with my own part in this? And if, if you can honestly say no, then great. <laughs> you can reflect on that. Like I didn't do anything wrong. No sila was broken. It's okay. Like whatever the other person is feeling, we can talk about it. But I, I can stand firm in the knowledge that I did my best. And if you didn't, if you did have 
some part in this that was not wholesome, then looking at that too, it's like, okay, yep, that was a mistake. I can go apologize tomorrow. I can, I can work on my emotions now so that next time it happens, I don't have the same automatic reaction. I'm not lashing out or I'm not um, feeling so angry even, even just for myself, just like regardless of the other person in the situation, like I know anger is not wholesome and I'm going to train myself to look at ways, look at things in a way that doesn't feed the anger. It might arise, it might flash up, it might be like, oh, okay. Uh, you just take that moment to be like, have the mindfulness to let go. You know, you take the moment to step back from being sucked into the anger. And it takes effort to learn how to do it too. You have to, you have to be patient. Um, this works with anything, not just anger, any kind of impatience even. You have to have patience <laughs> to learn to be impatient, and like not impatient. You have to um, spend the time to, I, I like to feel the feelings in my body. So where does the impatience live in my body when it arises? A lot of the times it kind of sits right in the pit of my stomach, say, or sometimes I notice myself like clenching my hands a little bit. And so just watching the, the bodily actions with the emotions helps me to be more aware of them and to have that space between the emotion and my mind. So that's, that's where the mindfulness comes in. It's like mindfulness of body helps you not get sucked in mentally to whatever unwholesome state there is. And it also works with wholesome states too. So, you know, spending the time when, when you do have mudita say for somebody else, somebody gets, you know, someone's having a baby and they're all excited or something. And having, have feeling the mudita, where does that arise in my body? It's kind of up here in my chest somewhere, you know, it's like, oh, great, you know, and, and you want to smile and, you know, be happy for them too. And, and noticing that is good. Also, the wholesome things are important to notice too. When you've done something nice for someone else, it's good to acknowledge it. I mean, I think so many of us are not wanting to accept praise or, um, we don't want to feel like we're not being humble enough. We don't want to feel like we're puffing ourselves up. Yes, I did this great thing. Aren't I great? You know, and it's, it's important to be able to acknowledge the good stuff too, because, well, number one is true. And number two, you're going to be a lot happier anyway in your daily life if you can take in the good. So oh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> So it's good, it's good to appreciate the good things about ourselves and other people like, oh, wasn't it that nice? It wasn't it nice that they did this nice thing for me. Like, like my friend wrote me a card and who gets snail mail anymore, really. Right. So it's just, as it was nice. I was like, oh, it's such a sweet thing that this person wrote me a card <laughs> and just appreciating the small things too. And that can help put your mind at ease and to go back and think about these things at the end of the day can help it be a good day to die. A lot of gratitude and appreciation goes a long way for me. So I enjoy that too. And things like um, Hiri Otapa, I don't know, is, are people generally familiar with Hiri and Otapa? No. Okay. Okay. So it's like, um, a lot of times you hear it translated as moral shame and moral dread. And I really don't like that translation. Cause it, I mean, it sounds scary. <laughs> it sounds like moral shame and moral dread is enough to like scare me off of it already. So what I think what it's really talking about is like, um, having, it's more like having a conscience, having a good sense of conscience and knowing what's right and wrong and good to do and not good to do and kind of accepting it and changing yourself. And it's also um, the otapa bit is like kind of understanding kama. So instead of dread, because you know the effects, it's, it's more about 
understanding how things work, how good actions lead to good results and bad actions lead to bad results. So when someone tells you Hiriotapa is moral shame and moral dread, don't listen to them. It's too scary. <laughs> At least it is for me. It's like, okay, okay. Having a conscience and understanding Kama lands a lot better for me. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, knowing that, that we're going to die and having these two things in mind can be very helpful. Um, a lot of self-reflection is needed and you can do it throughout the day too. You don't have to do it all at once and do it right before you go to bed and feel bad about things that happen during the day because I've done that and it doesn't help. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, like um, it's good to catch things sort of in the moment. It's in the suttas, the Buddha is talking to Rahula and one of them. And he's saying like, when you want to do something, is it a good thing? Like, should, should I do this thing? And if you don't, if you go ahead and do it and it's a good thing, great. But if you are in the midst of doing something and you haven't thought about it beforehand, you can stop midway and be like, oh, is this the right thing to do? Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Let's do it. No. Okay. I got to, I got to back out here and not do this thing that I'm going to do. That's not wholesome. And then if you've already missed the boat on that too, and you've done some unwholesome action or some wholesome action, reflecting on it after the fact is good too. So if it was a good thing to have done that you've already done, great. You can look at that and, and sort of congr congratulate yourself for it. Oh, that was good. I like that, you know, good results. And if it wasn't good, then you can reflect on what you could have done differently. And if you can make amends with whoever else it's affected negatively, but um, it's really important to, to spend the time to look at it after the fact, if you haven't been able to catch it before or during, and it's just much cleaner sila for yourself. And it makes the people around you trust you more. Like they feel that you're trustworthy because they know that if, if you've done something unwholesome, that you're going to come back to them and try to fix it and apologize and be a good person with them. You know, they don't have to fear that you'll be sneaky and hurt them in the background and not, not tell them about it later kind of a thing. So yep, good advice from the Buddha <laughs> before, during, and after reflection. And you know, I mean, for me, just mindfulness throughout the day, kind of, am I speaking nicely enough, gently enough? Um, am I being careful just washing the dishes or am I putting my shoes anywhere where someone's going to trip over them or, you know, small acts of, of mindfulness and kindness really do build up. And looking back on your day, I mean, I know if I've left my personal space kind of messy, my mind feels a little messy and it makes it a little harder to settle. And then it's, it doesn't feel, I mean, I know this sounds a little silly, but it doesn't feel like the best day to die. If you've left everything kind of all over the place and somebody comes and finds you and you're just a mess. <laughs> it's like all the small things that, that you wouldn't think of as being important for your death or for anything, maybe, you know, personal habit wise, like it, it, it does feel a lot cleaner mentally if you keep the physical things cleaner too. So, I mean, I know right now, like my bed is made and if I were to die, my things are put away enough to the point where people wouldn't have a lot of trouble kind of cleaning up after me when I'm gone. And it kind of helps. It's like, okay, so yeah, it's not such a bad day to die. I didn't leave things horribly for anyone else. <laughs> yeah. So it, I, this is just like, like all Dhamma practice, like the small things do add up. So just something to think about. And then when you go to bed, you can think that consciously, like, is this a good day to die? Like if I have a tomorrow, what are the things I would want to change tomorrow? Like, what would I want to do differently than I did today in those situations? Yeah. 
um, I'm looking at the, the comma and rebirth, I think is another important thing that I was thinking about earlier. It's like when people talk about it in terms of momentary kind of from the commentaries, this idea that comma and rebirth happen every moment. It's, it's not what's in the suttas. It's not what the Buddha saw on the night of his enlightenment. Like this is how the Buddha got enlightened. He saw his own past lives and he saw the past lives of other beings and how the kama works because of what they've done, their actions in that lifetime leading to their rebirth in the next. So to me, that really changes how I'm practicing. If it's just a momentary thing and when you die, nothing happens, your body just goes back to the elements, then so what, you know, like, what's the point of trying to have enlightenment? What is the, what is the enlightenment really about? So I think it's important to, to um, have that sense of consequence and have the sense of urgency, the samwega that comes up, knowing that when I pass away, there's going to be major consequences. And if I generally live my life in a wholesome way, I'm going to have a good rebirth. It might be in heaven. It might be on earth again. It might be human again. And that's going to be good enough. If I'm just, I've got good sila. I've been generous throughout my life. I've, I've cultivated my mind enough. And maybe I've spent time in the Brahma Viharas, practicing the Brahma Viharas, or maybe I've had jhana practice, good experiences with meditation that can put me somewhere um, in a heaven, heaven realm somewhere after birth. It's, it's good motivation to, to think about the afterlife, after this life. And I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not familiar with, with your group as much as um, Venerable Chanda would be. So I'm not sure where people stand on comma and rebirth in general, but knowing her, she's, she's definitely full on monastic, like comma and rebirth is real. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure if you have questions, you can ask her about them later. <laughs> but yeah, so it's just like the comma and rebirth make the enlightenment goal so much clearer. And it's good to spend time investigating it for yourself if you aren't completely sure. And to investigate why you're practicing if you're not completely sure about this aspect. So yeah, um, I think, I think those were probably my main thoughts on, on dying and how to create days that are good to die and making sure that, you know, you do everything you can right now to where you can be at peace and, and have a death that's more like the meditation that we did earlier. It's just kind of a gradual, peaceful stop of this, this body and mind. And maybe even the mind stops completely like the Buddha's in the end. So many suttas end with some monk or other, or even a lay person becoming enlightened through their own death. So if we can, if we can do it, if we can get enlightened during our life, great. And if not, death is a wonderful opportunity for it. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think, um, happy to answer questions for the next half hour or so. It doesn't have to be about the topic. Happy to answer whatever, if I can. If you have any question, you can raise your hand. I'll just unmute you. Derek was telling me earlier that 
Uh, a lot of people are on holiday this time of year. They've gone, so it's okay if all of us here are also on holiday. <laughs> no pressure for questions. <laughs> I know this is your husband's account, but yeah, uh, David, yes, sir. so yeah. Um, it's quite interesting you talking about this idea of, you know, it's a good day to die because any day could be that day. Um, but being in a Western community with uh, this is, I find it very difficult uh, to not put my views to my very Western orientated friends who would find the concepts baffling um, and frightening. Um, I, I treat a very um, moderate path uh, because they're, I mean, I'm, I'm in my seventies myself and many of my friends are much older mm -hmm. and are looking at the possibility of an ending of life. And it's very difficult to give them any support or solace because I'm coming from a completely different mind frame. So um, it's just a comment that, uh, yes, it's, um, I have found in um, sort of in this, the Buddhist teachings, a great deal of relief mm -hmm. in its attitude uh, to death and, and the teachings around death um but to, to um try and expose Ooh, a little a I, I wonder if you have any i any suggestions about how to approach people who do not come from a buddhist background sure yeah, I'm sorry, it, it was cutting out a little bit here and there, so I, I may oh, not sorry. have caught everything, but I think I get the gist, and yeah, it's kind of a problem. <laughs> I think if if you're Christian, it's right. a little bit easier if you're Christian because people do believe in heaven and hell, just like Buddhists. So Buddhists believe in, in sort of maybe different levels of heaven and different levels of hell, so, but it's still, you know, heaven realm, hell realm idea. And so if you're talking to someone who's Christian or at least open to the ideas of Christianity or familiar with Christianity, then talking about um, heaven and hell realms as a mm -hmm. rebirth, you're reborn in a heaven mm -hmm. realm or you're reborn mm -hmm. in a hell realm, that might help a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's like... Um, sort of if you're good you're going to heaven if you've been good all your life if you've done good things and you haven't broken like the 10 commandments say if you haven't broken those 10 commandments then you're going to go to heaven and if you have um if you've been bad if you've broken commandments or sinned a lot or something and you haven't sort of asked god for forgiveness um and did like penance or repentance or whatever then you're probably going to go to hell so people are generally familiar with that kind of cause and effect idea that kind of rebirth idea so you might mm -hmm. want to talk about that um or you could talk about that and i mean i like that in the suttas he talks about even if there isn't like a rebirth i think it, this was the kalama sutta maybe talking about like even if there's no life after this one, if you're, if you're good now, you're going to have good results. Now, if you're kind to people and generous and helpful, then in this life, you get the benefits. So even if there's no next life, you're benefiting now, it doesn't matter. And the same with the unwholesome things. If you're, you know, greedy and mean and ugly and angry with people and violent, then you're not going to have very good <laughs> come up right now you might end up in prison or something mm -hmm. you know so just talking about it mm -hmm. in in ways that they can relate to that are more apparent right now is good um yeah i think yeah i think that generally helps people get the gist of it so yeah that's my experience <laughs> 
Yeah. If I, I think of anything else, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Next will be Leah. Is that a Search to unmute. Thanks. Hi. Um, I've got a question. Well, my question is this. So um, how important it, is it to have a good death? I mean, at the moment, let's say you've been a really good person all your life, but then you have a bad death. I don't know. You're angry or, or you're shot or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this question comes up sometimes because it does show up in in the um, canon that the moment of death does matter somewhat. But how much? I, I question too. I can't imagine it's a lot. I figure if this is just my conjecture. So if you've been good all your life, you're going to reap the benefits of the goodness all your life. And if you have that moment of anger, it might be a like brief rebirth somewhere not so nice, perhaps, or it might be mm, a little bit of trouble <laughs> for your birth process next, you know? Um, so I, I can't imagine it being as important as, you know, 70 plus years of being good, having a moment of anger or intense fear perhaps because yeah. that's that's not unlikely so yeah it might be a flash of of a hell realm experience like an unpleasant experience but i can't imagine it would be very long because just the way comma works you know like spending that amount of time being good versus this amount of unwholesomeness it doesn't balance out <laughs> Yeah. Can I can I ask another a couple more questions? Sure. How long does it take to so from the moment you die until your actual you know consciousness? So you know I was brought up a Catholic, so I think of a soul. Uh, you leave your body. That uh, is there a, a, a sort of like a day or a, I don't. How long does it take? And also I don't know if this is like an exact science, but or if you can answer this question, is how long does it take for the moment you die you leave a body to the next rebirth mm -hmm. because, yeah yeah those are good questions that come up sometimes and i i think people don't really know the tibetans have a lot more um ideas about this than the theravadans do in general but it seems like there's some consensus this is not from the suttas or the buddha himself so who knows right but there's some consensus that like 49 days is kind of a theme of the body hanging around um, or hanging around the body, the, the sort of, I don't know, consciousness or, or soul. It's not really a soul, but the, you know, the being hanging around a little bit. And there's also like a hundred days kind of marker that people like to do ceremonies for. I don't know how much any of this is solid founded kind of, you know, you don't really see it so much from the Buddha or Arahants in the in the Vinaya or the um, suttas anywhere. So it's hard to say, and I wouldn't worry about it too much. <laughs> but it's a good it's a good question. People want to do the right things for their loved ones. You yeah, know? that's exactly why yeah. I was. Asking. Yeah, yeah, and it's nice. So I would I would be up for that, like a forty nine day kind of ceremony and a hundred day kind of ceremony with the intention of um sort of making merit for that being in case they're somewhere where that would help mm -hmm. so they say that making merit um only works really works this is from the suits i think actually so it only really works if the person is a hungry ghost Mm -hmm. if they're in the realm of the hungry ghosts doesn't really work if you're human again doesn't really work if you're a deva doesn't really work if you're an animal it's more about if you're in that in-between kind of realm of hungry ghosts so i would i would do things you know give to charity help people out do some kind of you know meritorious actions for your loved ones and um 
maybe on those days, the 49 day and the, the 100 day. I, I've also heard, and I don't know where this is from, so don't take it too strongly, but I've, I've heard that it's good to do stuff for three days for the person, like talk, talk to them, tell them things like it's okay to move on. It's you're going to go somewhere good and you can tell them, oh, I'm going to do this for you and this for you, you know, kind of just talk to the being a little bit, especially if you kind of feel their presence around. Some people can, you know, feel it more than other people can. So if you've got the sense that they're there, it's likely and, and you can talk to them and do good things for them and encourage them to go to the good stuff, like the good, the good realms and encourage them to practice too you know, talk to them about Dhamma, tell them about the three characteristics and the four noble truths and the eightfold path. And it'll help keep your mind happy too. You know, the reminder about these things that we're all kind of reaping the benefits and detriments of our Kama. It's like, this is just how it is. And from here on out, we're going to do as much as we can for that person. And then also let go ourselves, encourage them to let go and let go ourselves. Mm. And I don't, I don't really know about the, how long it takes from sort of, what was your question? It was about like how long between the time they die and the time they go into a new form or. Yeah. 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 Don't really know. (laughs) Same things, you know, how long it takes for them, like the 49 days or the hundred days how long it takes to, to go from one to the next. I'm not sure. And I'm not sure it says um, in the poly canon anywhere. Okay. Maybe in the commentary. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> okay. Next will be Shirley. Uh, Shirley. <laughs> I remember Shirley. <laughs> Hello, Aya. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, it just made me think this idea of doing good things for for, 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 for loved ones. And, um, you know, in practice, I've been around Buddhism for a long time, so I mean, this is something that, that I would do. But my experience, when I gave a dana for my father, I just found felt he was sending me blessings. Uh-huh. And then when a dear friend died and I was very grief stricken and I made a, she wasn't Buddhist, she was pagan, I did a pilgrimage to Glastonbury and I don't want to go into any details but I really, really felt that she was sending me very many blessings and actually in a way <sighs> I mean, this is probably my imagination, but was instrumental in helping me begin to love myself. And she had, she sent me a text before she died. She had leukemia, and she said, um, "My older, my older being. This is a long time ago. Um, both are a long time ago." But may all, may all beings, may all the kindly beings in the universe recognize one of their own and embrace you in, 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 in a warm hug or something like that, which was very lovely. But I really felt for a long time that she was um, looking after me. So is this our imagination or do you think, I mean, there's nothing actually in uh, the Buddhist teachings that would suggest that this happens. I suppose if they've been reborn in a deva realm, they can they, they, they can they can still look after you i think so i think it's true like it doesn't matter so much um if you're doing meritorious deeds for them if they're in a deva realm it doesn't mean they don't know you're doing it and they're not sort of reciprocating mm. it doesn't know that you're not it doesn't mean that they're not aware that you're thinking of them and doing this it might not have the same benefits because they're already fine up in that deva realm what do they need you know they're okay up there so they might not have it might not have the same effect as if it's someone in a hungry ghost realm but it doesn't mean that the connection's not there that they're not seeing this and and feeling happy about it and also wanting to share merit with you and blessing you so i wouldn't i wouldn't write it off (laughs) yeah i mean my friend i sort of it was really a sort of pilgrimage for me to help me deal with it but I really felt 
this, 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 you know, this weird connection for a long, a long time. But yeah. I, think, I think maybe there was a karmic connection uh, the way we met. Um, yeah. But uh, I don't know, it's just mysterious. <laughs> so. yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. Even if it's not real, I, I don't have any reason to doubt that it's real. Say, you know, like there's no reason to doubt that this is real for you mm -hmm. and for them. But yeah, um, yeah, it, it doesn't hurt anything. You know, it's like the more the more love we have, the better. <laughs> the more meta and the more um, wholesome connections like this, it's fine. It's good. So. I wouldn't worry about whether it's like, you know, there's some way to find objective, objectively that it's real. It's still good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think, is the time up yet? Oh, oh, did we go over? Maybe we went over. I don't know, did we go over? Not yet. No, okay. it's not tight. There's still uh, 40, uh, 15 minutes. Oh, good. Okay, okay. I can remember when it was over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, looks like someone's waving. Oh. Taryn? Uh huh. Couldn't find the, the raise hand button, maybe. <laughs> Taryn, should I go ahead and I can ask to unmute? Yeah, I'll ask Terry to unmute. There we go. I think he's on now. Um, yeah, I couldn't find the button to um, raise the hand, so I just waved. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, hello. Yeah, I really, I found it very good, the meditation, um, somehow as a way of letting go like that, but using the idea of death as a way of letting go into a meditation. I really thought that was good. And then what you said about anger, because I've had a lot of trouble at work lately and like hanging on to a lot of anger and resentment and being a bit uh, not very good, really. <laughs> and, and, and the effect of that. So what you were saying about, you know, I really resonated with that. It's like trying to let go of, the, you know, dealing with resentments and, you know, feeling that you haven't been treated badly and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah i found that really but how to actually do that sometimes sometimes it's so um it's churning so much in your mind things in your mind you know that it's hard to really let go of them um i have been like you know going going to sleep and having using my phone and having dhamma talks into my ears and things like that or guided meditations including some of yours <laughs> yeah. kind of ways to try and you know deal with all that but but the thing I wanted to ask really was um, about like believing in karma and rebirth and things like that, because I thought there was a thing in Buddhism about it's like you don't, you know, you shouldn't really believe in anything unless you've actually experienced it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, but it seems like it, you know, it's not that I disbelieve in it, and I've kind of got experiences in my life that I kind of, believe, you know, I suppose I do to an extent believe in it, but. To be honest, I don't really know for sure. I don't have got no direct things. I've got a few things that I think are memories of past lives and then people I've known in this life, I've felt that we've known each other before. I've got some of those ideas, but I don't, you know, it's like, so at some point it's like a, it's a, like a leap of faith, isn't it? Yeah, can, yeah, it can be. If, if you're going to take on a belief system of, of one sort or another. So I, yeah. I don't know. You know, maybe if you take the leap of faith, then it becomes clearer whether it's true or not. But I, I don't, I don't quite know how that works. Or should I just yeah. remain objective? Or you know, I think it's fine to remain objective. I think it's it's um, detrimental for Buddhist practice if you just completely cut off the possibility. If you like firmly yeah. don't believe in that and and don't want to open your mind to the possibility but it sounds like you're in a good place with it it's like okay there's a little bit of evidence i feel like this could yeah. be real and i'm just gonna like keep it keep it open you know keep it like okay yeah. so it's possible there's a little bit of reason for faith here you don't have to have some big like experience yourself of yeah. you know seeing clearly a past life with 
like they talk about in the suttas, you know, your name and your clan and what kind of food you had and what kind of status and job you've had, you know, mm. like you don't have to go there. It's like any kind of little inkling is, is just good to keep it there and be like, oh yeah, there was that thing with that person. That's, that's good enough. It's just to yeah. leave the door open to it and not, not shut out the possibility. So I think it's okay. I think you're in a good place. You don't have to like say firmly, yes, I know there's past lives and come and rebirth is totally real. And I've experienced it completely for myself. It's okay. You just have the possibility there. Like the door's open. It's not shut. So it's okay. You're yeah. In a good place with that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. I was, I don't, um, like one of my things is that I, someone I was friends with from the age of 11 at school, mm -hmm. I had a kind of instant recognition thing with him. Uh -huh. And then, and then as it happens, when he, this is probably why I'm involved in Buddhism to an extent is like when he was about 17 or 18, he went to Chithurst, which I think, you know, probably uh -huh. you know, Chithurst monastery. He was like, a, he was a Anagarika there for a while, but then uh -huh. he dropped out of it and did other things. Uh -huh. And then he was a bhikkhu for a while, you know, in Thailand. And, um, but unfortunately he also had mental health problems. Uh -huh. He always had kind of stuff going on. Um, and he eventually killed himself about eight years ago. Oh, so, wow. So it's kind of, <laughs> I've got that kind of thing that, that I think probably, you know, that was kind of my introduction to Buddhism, although other things happened in a way. Mm -hmm. But it's like the balance between, well, so if you're talking about merit, I don't expect, I'm not asking you to give some analysis of all that. But obviously he did, he was practicing Dhamma and he was a good person anyway, even when he wasn't, when he was doing other wild stuff in the world, yeah. <laughs> all sorts yeah. of things. But um, but obviously, you know, a lot of depression as well, which ended in, you know, he wanted to just finish it by killing himself. Yeah. So, you know, which obviously is a bad karma thing, I know, in the belief system, obviously. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know why I yeah. said all that, really. But, you know. <laughs> well, of, well it, sometimes we process out loud. <laughs> it's a whole complicated story. Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah. I did want to address a little bit about um working with anger some because yeah, yeah. this has that been up for, for other it. people too <laughs> around <laughs> here so um one thing i can say that does work for not just anger for but a lot of the unwholesome emotions was what i was talking about earlier kind of you you can drop the storyline from work and just bring up the feeling of anger in your body feel where you feel it like is there heat where do you feel the anger is it in your chest or your abdomen do you feel it in your your hands or your arms or you know try to get a sense of the physical feeling of where the anger is and then sort of just spend time with it there in your body like where it is and you can watch it arise and you can watch it as it's moving through and you can watch it pass away just watch as you you're not angry anymore <laughs> but yeah. try to stay stay with it the whole way through and then that will help it not be so strong when it comes up later it's like there's there's less um, energy behind it to, to sort of feel it through and it's going to be tricky to sort of drop the storyline around it but yeah. it's best if you can to whatever extent you can don't think about the the things that happen so much but working with the feeling might yeah. be might be helpful so you can try that let me know how it goes no that sounds good that sounds <laughs> yeah because yeah. so some of what you said about righteous indignation is like when people at work have said things which i kind of think are discriminatory and stuff like that and it's like oh they shouldn't have said that and then it's but it's just channel it's like a tape loop it's just like i know i've just got to leave it there's no point kick <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah but that sounds, you know, I'll try, I'll try those ideas. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and next it would be Manori. So I'll ask her to unmute. Hello. Um, I, I thought I, uh, I'm originally from Sri Lanka. So I thought I'll share a bit about what I've, learned from the Sri Lankan Theravada monks. Um, 
So I think there's a there's a sutta called Abhaya Sutta, fearless, that mm -hmm. it talks about, um, you must be knowing much better, I, I, I've just kind of scratched the surface on it. And um, so I was I was having a chat with my sister about this, you know, with I and how long it takes. Uh, then she was telling, no, um, uh, the, the Sri Lankan Theravada, the Buddhist, the, the, the priest, they, they always tell that it is, you know, you die and that's the consciousness. It's, a, it's not a soul. You need a body yeah. to have that consciousness. So the next thought is, is, the, is, is another form. And then until you kind of get your, I don't know, nerves or brains or whatever, that same thought builds up. It's a process of thoughts. It's the same thought comes on and on and on. So I've, I've listened to listen to Buddhist monks talking about it, but I don't know much about the connection with the suttas, but then I, I, I got this Abhya Sutta Fearless um, that, that talks about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and it says like, you know, um, you know, a concept of soul, that means you are, you can, in the, the processes of thoughts can independently lie around and it can't hear you because there's no sensors, there's no body, and there's no, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't believe in a soul, so there has to be an, there has to be a form to attach. And if you believe that there is, uh, there is a soul, a kind of, it kind of goes against the doctrine of the anatta. So that is, that is what I've, I've kind of heard about. I was, I was, you know, searching for this thing a lot last year because it's a very curious subject isn't it yeah yeah it is it's like um even without a body because we have the formless realms you know there's no form there for things to act on you don't really need the form to still have that type of um i guess it's a form of consciousness not just like regular consciousness that we think about like if someone's unconscious in the hospital you know but the, the form that's still active, that still has the kama attached to it, that's functioning there. So it's just kind of interesting to wrap your head around. And I don't know how much we can wrap our heads around it without more experience <laughs> of, of things, you know, um, even in, in meditation, say jhana practice or something, I think you get the sense of it more um, clearly that way. So yeah, it's like, a lot of this stuff is kind of interesting and fun to think about and like conjecture, but I think the best way for us to really understand it is through probably meditation experience. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Are we, are we good now? Any more questions? Got a couple of minutes. We have one minute. We can ask a quick question. <laughs> okay. Maybe if there's no immediate questions, I would just like to take this opportunity to thank you so much, Ayachit Ananda, for being here with us and for sharing with us. Yeah, happy to. <laughs> and it's uh, always very nice to have other perspectives from, we have Venerable Chanda's perspective quite often. It's very nice to have your perspective as well now. Thank you for sharing. Yes, happy to. Um, I like doing it together too with her. So <laughs> it's kind of nice to have uh, for me to hear her perspective as well. She's, she's got a lot of wisdom and I appreciate her um, thoughts a lot too. So, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully when she's back from retreat, you'll be able to come and join again and, yeah. and we can have both of you talking. <laughs> okay. Um, I would also like to say a few notices really, because we've had lots of people writing to us to ask how Venerable is and I'm happy to reassure everyone that I heard from her quite recently and she's doing very well and she would like to pass on that she can sense and feel your uh, generosity and your well wishes and your meta and she feels that it's really benefiting her in her practice so thank you to everyone who sends meta and also generous donations thank you all and she also would like me to point uh, to pass on that there is a pre-recorded meta meditation that she's done for Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday. And this can be found on the Anukampa events page, which I will put into the chat box in a minute. 
it's anucamperproject.org forward slash events. And of course, as always, if you would like to donate and support the Anacamper Project, then you can do so at anacamperproject.org forward slash donate. It's all in the chat box now, and thank you very much for being here again. Look forward to seeing you soon. Did, did Anna want to say anything really quick before we go? Say something, Anna. Uh, yes, thank you. I have a, a short question because uh, what we can do, because um, I have very strict internal judge inside of, of my head, inside of my mind. So uh, what can we do when it, this voice arises and it's uh, turning on? Yes, we can do something. Yeah, I have that voice too sometimes. <laughs> I think a lot of us do. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, questioning it is good. It sounds so definite and so judgmental and so clear. And it's like, if it's saying you're not good enough or something, you know, it's like asking it, is that true? You know, <laughs> doing a little more digging, like, is that true? Like, in what ways do you think that's true? And kind of talking to it like it's another person kind of helps. You know, it's like having enough um, awareness, you know, it's there and you know when it's coming up and having enough um, of a good voice to sort of argue with it a little bit might help. <laughs> Just like, is that true? <laughs> Did I really, am I really a bad person? Am I a bad person? Come on, really? You know, just kind of see what comes up out of it, <laughs> you know, see if you can poke it back. Don't take it laying down. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I yeah, will try. Good luck. <laughs> okay. Okay. Looks like it's time to head out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aya. Have so, a good evening. <laughs> I'm going to unmute everybody and uh, no, I'm going to stop the recording first and unmute you all to say goodbye. <laughs>